Hello, everybody. My name's William um, Padilla Brown. I see people I haven't didn't see yesterday, which is cool. Uh, yesterday, I did a talk. Uh, it was more like an introduction to fungi. Uh, what the heck are fungi? Uh, what are mushrooms? Uh, a little bit about what I do. Um, I'll cover a little bit more about what I do and who I am for anybody that's unfamiliar. And then we'll rock out with a little bit more of a cultivation overview, talk more about the cultivation process. Um, we're going to do a similar uh, coffee ground inoculation uh, for anybody that got to participate in that yesterday. You might get an extra bag if you don't want one or don't need one. Um, you don't need to take one. Uh, but we're going to cover a little bit more here today. All righty. Isn't that a handsome guy? Um, I, want, I want you guys to be able to grow two, three pound oyster clusters like that someday. Um, so yeah, this was our uh, farm 3.0. I showed this one yesterday. Um, whenever I first started cultivating mushrooms, I did not have a lot of money to buy these racks. Uh, the racks that we get are about $50 base price. Um, and I needed a lot of them to cultivate mushrooms. So I just went out and bought paracord. Um, I saw some videos out of Southeast Asia, Southern Asia, of uh, different mushroom farmers cultivating mushrooms uh, from hanging rope ladders. Uh, so I just made a simple rope ladder design, tied two together, and hung my mushroom bags like that. Uh, with the shelves, you're able to put more mushrooms into a smaller space, so it is a little bit more effective for the cultivation. Uh, but this is a very good way to get started if you don't have enough money to go out and buy those racks. And as you could see, the mushrooms were happy. Uh, we were getting large flushes of oyster mushrooms. At this time, we were growing uh, blue uh, and elm oyster mushrooms. The blue mushrooms do very well in the cold. We switched to blue mushrooms in the winter to uh, help us with our utilities. We don't want to overextend uh, the amount of utilities that we're using uh, at any given point of the year, so we will switch the mushroom species that will grow in hotter weather in the summer and then colder weather in the winter time. Uh, so we'll work with the blue oysters. Uh, they'll be able to fruit at 55 degrees. We'll also work with uh, Namico mushroom, chestnut mushrooms, uh, which will do better in the colder temperatures, uh, as well as enoki. Um, I really prefer fruiting oyster mushrooms out of the top. A lot of people will fruit oyster mushrooms out of the side of the bag. Uh, when they're fruiting upward, uh, they give a more of a flower uh, effect uh, when they grow. Um, so yeah, this is a basement grow room. Um, this was in a basement. I had uh, blocked out the window and put a uh, duct, uh, ducting on the window, an exhaust fan that was pulling air out. I had a filter on one end of the room, uh, so fresh air would come in through the filter passively because of the, it was the only place for air to come in. Um, and then all the air and spores, uh, all the CO2 enriched air from the mushrooms and spores would get sucked out. And then they would just get their fresh oxygen through the filtered air in there. Um, I had a humidification bucket um, in there. Uh, in our farm now, we have a humidification uh, rain barrel uh, where we have fill it up with water. Uh, we put a pond fogger in there, and then we have a fan on there that pushes the uh, humidity that the pond fogger creates out of the barrel. Uh, this super, super low tech uh, way of creating humidity in your rooms. Uh, so just a close up on those beautiful blues. Uh, so this is in the lab. Um, this is, the lab has been a crazy process. If anybody wants to follow it, uh, you can check out the YouTube Apex Grower. Um, you can see from when I started just in a box. In the very back there, there is a tote uh, with armholes on it. Uh, if anybody wants to pass that along to the front, I'll show everybody at some point. Um, but that was, the, that was the lab 1.0. You can take that box out of there and just pass the, the, the tote back with a the, with the lid that's right there. Yeah, or without the lid, doesn't matter. All right, so this was my first laboratory, this tote here. Um, whenever it has the lid on it, uh, you can consider this a still air box uh, where there's not air flowing. At any given time, if the light's proper, you'll see particles floating through the air. Um, you don't want that landing on your mushroom work. Uh, and the most part for ha the, mo the most, the reason for having a laboratory when working with mushrooms is for the sterility. Um, you're not like mad scientists creating all sorts of weird things or doing all sorts of crazy science experiments in there. For the most part, you're just uh, opening sterile material and putting mushrooms into that sterile material. Um, so you can do that very low tech uh, with a tote. Um, so I would just stick my arms in here, uh, put on some gloves, spray my hands with alcohol, clean this thing out every time, and I would do my sterile work inside of this laboratory until I upgraded. Uh, eventually, I got a HEPA filter. Um, I don't know if I might, I might have the picture on the next one, but I got a, uh, uh, a big HEPA filter and I mounted it onto a box with a fan on the back of it. Uh, so that's my filter box. Um, 
kind of going off the model of like a laminar flow hood that you would see in a, in a proper laboratory. Um, so as you can see, we use child labor. Um, uh, I, do, I do a lot of education. We teach uh, all ages. None of my classes have an age cap on it. Um, I, don't, I don't recommend people bring babies to our class because that might be a distraction. Um, I do encourage pregnant women. Uh, and we've had, I've taught kids uh, from ages five and up uh, mushroom cultivation. This little girl was 11 and she did uh, spore isolations and cloning of cordyceps mushrooms. Um, that's pretty cool. Uh, so yeah, we expand out a lot of our cultures. Um, we sell a lot of these liquid culture syringes. This is the number one thing that we sell on our online store on Etsy and on mycoshop.net. It is a little syringe. You could pass this around. Uh, you could see there is fungus floating around in that liquid in there. So it's a sugar broth uh, that the fungus is using the sugar as its carbon source and living inside of that uh, aqueous solution. And that could be utilized to uh, start new cultures. Um, a colleague of mine, uh, Peter McCoy, uh, he's preaching that um, liquid cultures are the future of mycology. Um, when you're working with liquid cultures versus the, the old ways of working with petri dishes, uh, you never actually have to open the container. Um, the fungus never has to be exposed uh, to the environment. So whenever I first started, I was working with petri dishes a lot. I also was working with a lot of liquid cultures because I learned mycology on the internet. People were showing uh, uh, how to use liquid cultures on the internet. They're sold on the internet, so I was able to get uh, them very easily. Um, but you can see these petri dishes here. If I want to access this fungi in there, I have to open the whole petri dish. So that requires a little bit more sterility if I'm going to be opening something and exposing it to the environment. With the liquid culture, it stays inside of that uh, syringe until I take it to the jar. Um, and whenever we're working with materials on the small scale, uh, we'll be sterilizing it in a pressure cooker. Um, so the material in here is sterile, and, it never, and I never open this. I just stick the needle right through the top of this jar and introduce the culture that way. So the mushrooms are always staying in a closed environment. Liquid culture is way easier to do without a laboratory. You could do this in a clean kitchen. You could do this in a bathroom. Once you have your grain spawn, you're, like, you're at superhero status. You can use this to start get playing a little bit dirty. Uh, the bigger your spawn gets, the, the uh, more aggressive you can, uh, uh, the more aggressive it'll grow. Um, for anybody that participated yesterday, we just opened up a bag of mushroom spawn and introduced it into coffee grounds. We're going to go over the same thing. Um, but the reason that we can do this is because when we're working with such a larger uh, amount of this mus mushroom material, um, it has the advantage over the little particles and uh, bacteria that haven't fully grown on the uh, substrate. So this is what our farm looks like now. Um, right when uh, the week that I took this picture, we harvested 300 pounds. Uh, they were just starting to pop out of the holes on the side. You can see little pins starting to uh, pop out there. Uh, but we harvested 300 pounds in one week. Uh, right now we're harvesting about 150 to 200 pounds. We have our different uh, racks on rotation uh, so that we can keep up with our markets. Uh, we do our market in my hometown, or the, the town that I call home, uh, New Cumberland. Uh, we do, uh, next week we're starting a market in Lemoyne where the farm is. Our farm is actually 0.2 miles away from this market, where, so we're gonna be the closest purveyor. And that's the case for a lot of the things because we're one of the only urban farms in our area. So we're nine times out of 10 the closest purveyor for any of the restaurants or markets that we sell to. Uh, we do Harrisburg. Uh, we, we sell through another distributor at the Broad Street Market, which is the oldest running market in the United States. Uh, we sell at the Hershey Market for all the rich people. Uh, and uh, we also do the Harrisburg Farm Show Market on Tuesdays and Fridays. So we have a lot of uh, markets that we need to pr provide mushrooms for, so it's very important that we keep up with that uh, rotation and we keep producing uh, that amount of mushrooms. We grow our mushrooms on a mixture of hardwood sawdust, mixed hardwood sawdust from York County where we get a truckload for $5 and then we supplement it uh, with a nitrogen source being coffee grounds so that the mushrooms can produce the protein, uh, protein needing a nitrogen, uh, nitrogenous base. Um, so yeah, this is what it looks like in full fruit. Um, these were a little bit past where I wanted to be when you see that like rippling effect on the caps, they're like a, just a little bit uh, too old. Uh, you wanna get them when the caps are like nice and firm and uh, haven't flipped up yet. Um, but we just have full rows. We call that the oyster hall. Uh, we do gold oyster and gray oyster for the most part. We're switching over to a lot more gold and pink uh, because it's starting to get warmer uh, and they do better in the warm climates. Um, over the past couple of years, I found most of my success uh, with the cordyceps mushroom. Um, cordyceps in nature will grow on insects. Um, in Asia, um, Thailand, Korea, Vietnam, and uh, China, and Taiwan, um, 
it's mostly Thailand. Thailand was where it originated. People figured out how to cultivate cordyceps mushrooms on grain-based substrates. Um, all of the literature uh, since the 90s when this was figured out has been in Asian languages uh, until I wrote this handbook. Um, and I figured out how to grow this mushroom by watching YouTube videos uh, from Asia that I couldn't understand. I just followed whatever they were doing on there and figured out how to grow the mushroom. Um, we learned a lot about this. This is volume one of the handbook. I'm working on volume two. I'm also working on a uh, handbook for algae cultivation. Uh, so a lot on my plate. But yeah, this is where I found most of the success with my mushroom cultivation. And believe it or not, this might be one of the easiest mushrooms to cultivate. Uh, a lot of mushroom farmers are starting from spawn, so they just buy already uh, inoculated mushroom blocks, they're ready to go. You put them inside of a room, a humid room, and they will just start popping out mushrooms. They don't have the laboratory, they don't go through that whole lab process. Um, but if you take the opportunity to learn about just making grains, sterile grains and pressure cookers, uh, then you'll be able to grow cordyceps mushrooms because they just grow on grains inside of a jar. You don't even need to have a full room that's uh, producing humid environment or anything like that. The biggest thing with cordyceps mushroom is that they like to be cold. They like to be at 65 degrees consistently. Doing, if you uh, get a room, a small room, uh, maybe a large closet, a pantry area, uh, and equip it with an air conditioner and utilize that electricity to keep that room at 65 degrees, it will be worth it for the cultivation of these mushrooms. Uh, I sell two grams of these mushrooms for $10. It's one of the most expensive mushrooms that are on the market right now, uh, and they're in high demand. We're the only ones producing fruit bodies. Everybody else that's just learning how to produce fruit bodies is uh, learning from uh, my literature and the classes that we've been holding. Um, so there's a large market for that. I, I've been trying to encourage a lot of people to get into it. Um, so this is another thing we do at our lab. This is not necessary for mushroom cultivation, but we have introduced a lot of uh, Northeast and Mid-Atlantic mushroom cultures to the greater market, and we have an international market. Uh, so I've equipped my laboratory with molecular biology equipment, and I've been training myself and working with uh, different um, uh, practitioners, different scientists, uh, one being Alan Rockefeller over at uh, Counterculture Labs in uh, uh, Oakland, California. He's been uh, getting a lot of play, a lot of uh, uh, recognition for his name in doing um, DNA analysis on mushrooms. So we're going to be analyzing the DNA of the wild mushrooms that we're finding. Uh, maybe we might have a new species, who knows, uh, just help us to better understand the organisms that we're working with. Um, and I think it's important to uh, have these kinds of ex more expensive equipment or have uh, different scientists working together in communities creating kind of uh, community laboratories like, uh, like community gyms um, where you can go get your brain gains on. Um, but you just go up in there and get a membership and kind of use equipment and, uh, and converse with people that are uh, versed in the different sciences because uh, there's definitely a need for this as more people start to uh, become entrepreneurs and start their own businesses, especially in the um, agriculture and biotechno uh, biotechnology realms. Um, so I focus on a lot of low-tech, no-tech, as, as far out as I got with the whole laboratory thing. Um, I teach a lot in inner cities, um, so I focus on very low-tech ways of cultivating mushrooms that don't require a lot of money, doesn't require a lot of investment. When I first got into mushrooms, same with algae, um, I saw so many videos and so much uh, uh, literature from people that have these multi-million dollar laboratories and they're like, oh, well, if you want to set up this grow room, you're going to build this out from the start and all this and that. And I'm just this poor kid from New Cumberland. I'm just like, whoa, um, I got to pay rent and bills and like then I'm not going to have any money. So like I got to figure out how to grow these mushrooms on the side. Uh, without that any money. So that's what I did. Um, so a lot of these techniques, anybody can replicate them and start to produce resource for themselves. Um, so it's an important micro-resilience skill um, to be able to work with materials that you, can, you wouldn't be able to find in the store um, is very helpful if there's ever a survival situation. I forced myself to learn how to clone and start mushroom cultures with nothing, that, like just trash and things. Um, I actually uh, cloned a Heresia marinaceus lion's mane mushroom on a paper towel and a sandwich baggie uh, out in the woods just to show that I could do it and be able to expand that culture. So you can like throw me on an island, I'll find some medicinal or edible fungi, clone it on my clothes, and start a mushroom farm. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's really important to know these kinds of things, uh, especially with a lot of us coming from uh, the standpoint of understanding uh, that our systems are very fragile at this time. Um, and it also addresses low socioeconomic areas where people don't have money. Uh, a lot of the uh, education that I did myself um, when I was learning about mushroom farms was from Southern Asia and places where they hadn't industrialized and they don't have as many uh, as much access to um, Home Depot and thing like things like that, like we do. Uh, so their mushroom farms are just all low tech. Uh, a lot of times they're like 
trees that they cut down with a tarp over the top of it and racks that they made out of trees. Um, they just cut it down, made diff their own everything and have their mushrooms popping out all over the walls and everything way more effective than we're doing. Um, it's efficient, just like I said, and it's an excellent teaching tool because it could be replicated. Um, so yeah, step one, obtain a culture. There are so many ways to obtain cultures. When I first started, I just ordered liquid cultures online. We sell liquid cultures online. Uh, you can go out into the forest and clone mushrooms. It's very easy to clone mushrooms onto paper, cardboard. Um, I have videos on my YouTube. There's lots of videos on YouTube right now uh, showing how you can clone uh, oyster mushrooms onto cardboard. You can even clone dry mushrooms. Oh, I don't I have a huge bag of dry mushrooms back there. If anybody's interested, we've got lots of oyster mushrooms from our farm. Um, but yeah. Um, you can clone dry mushrooms. Mushrooms will stay alive for up to two to three years while they're dry and it's way easier to reanimate dry mushrooms than actually clone wet mushrooms. When you go and pick a wet mushroom out of the forest, there's bacteria on it. Whenever you have that dry mushroom, because of the, uh, the, how dry it is, the bacteria is not able to uh, live on it anymore and you can start it that way. It's a, a little bit more effective. Um, so yeah, you can buy the cultures from online vendors. You can come to festivals and events like this, and uh, there's a lot more mushroom farms popping up where people are distributing cultures, um, and you can clone your own to begin with. Um, whoa, I skipped like a bunch. All right, so spawn versus cultures. Um, spawn will usually refer to a body of fungus grown on a substrate. Um, so I have some coffee spawn here. Um, this is already uh, fully colonized. Uh, if I rip some holes in this, then it'll start producing mushrooms. Uh, feels pretty cool. So yeah, that was just a bag of coffee grounds that I introduced a culture of oyster mushrooms into. It grew over it, took over it. Um, we would refer to that as spawn now. Um, Typically, it's grown on sawdust or grains. If you're going to be ordering it online from any commercial distributor, you're probably going to get a big bag of sawdust or a big bag of grains. Um, and it'll, it'll typically say uh, what it is because some people prefer one over the other depending on what you're going to be doing. If you're going to be introducing it to out, on outdoor, um, some people, I personally prefer uh, when doing log cultivation, introducing sawdust spawn instead of the typical plugs. Um, you just get way more bang for your buck. So if I was going to uh, do log cultivation, uh, I, wouldn't, I would order sawdust over grains uh, because if you put grains into logs, then the bugs are going to be way more attracted to that. Um, so yeah, um, different mushroom farmers prefer different uh, ways of starting their cultivation depending on whether they have a lab or not. Um, cultures usually refer to a small living fungus growing on a petri dish or uh, in a syringe. Uh, or in a slant. Uh, some people will just sell these little slants with a little bit of agar in there, maybe a toothpick or a piece of a popsicle stick. Um, and it's just a way to, to ship a little bit of culture, very inexpensive, and then you can start that and expand it out as, however much you want. Um, you could think that every culture or every uh, piece of spawn uh, could be expanded to 10 times its volume. Um, it's really easy to think about that with the syringes because they have 10 cc's for the most part, so you can split it out 10 times. That bag of spawn uh, would break it up into 10 bags the same size of that. Or um, with the sawdust spawn, um, people will expand that out onto straw, uh, very low-tech method, do that outside, and they'll expand that onto about 10 times the volume of the straw. Is there a generational uh, limitation on how many times you would multiply that out? Um, you, you'll start to see uh, your, your mushroom get a little bit tired. If you order a fresh mushroom culture um, from a, a accredited lab or one that's, that's well known for having uh, good cultures, typically they're giving you a very young generation of that culture. Um, and you could expand that out pretty much to like dumpster size before it starts to get tired and fruit it out for a couple years before it starts to get tired. Um, but it's recommended that you fruit your mushrooms uh, um, soon whenever you get them, see how, how they look, how fresh, how fresh they are, how firm they are, um, how the caps look, um, to, to get an idea of how, uh, what, what its peak health is, uh, so you can see it as it grows further and further and see if it's starting to uh, produce fruits that are a little less, uh, less um, desirable than whenever you first got it. Um, uh, so yeah. We do our liquid cultures, we do our petri dishes. Typically, we're only working with petri dishes when we're doing cloning or starting new cultures. Uh, we'll expand from a petri dish uh, into a jar of liquid. Um, 
We'll do uh, jars of liquid with uh, a little filter here. Uh, this is a poly, polyester fiber fill, uh, like the same stuff that's in pillows. It's inorganic, so the fungus won't grow on it and bacteria won't grow on it. Um, and on the other side of our liquid culture jars, we'll put a little bit of RTV silicone, high, temp high temperature silicone, so we can put the jar into a pressure cooker and sterilize our liquid, uh, which is just a simple uh, mixture of sugar and water, a simple syrup and water. Um, so we'll, we'll expand our petri dishes into a jar of liquid and then we'll be able to uh, use that silicone port to inject a needle and uh, suck up the liquid and then the silicone port will reclose every time you, you pull your uh, needle out. Um, so yeah, make, ensuring that you have a clean environment is going to be the next step if you want to uh, start your mushroom cultivation from uh, the beginning, so to speak, and be more in control of the cultures that you're using. Um, so you can use a glove box or you can uh, step up and build a HEPA filter. You could buy a HEPA filter um, and uh, start working in front of that. Basically what this is doing is just blowing clean air in front of me as I work in it. Uh, I work in front of it so any particles that are falling out of the air just get blown out of the way. I also keep my door closed in this room so it cycles all the air in the room uh, and then eventually the air is very clean in that room. Um, so agar, it's like jelly, like jello. Uh, you make it very similar to jello. Uh, it's the stuff that's in those petri dishes that I passed around. I just go to the Asian, uh, Asian mall and uh, buy a bunch of the packs of these telephone brand agar, and then I buy uh, a liter of coconut water. So I got this recipe from Thailand. It's the most easy one for me to do because the coconut water is next to the agar in the Asian mall. Um, so why do anything else? A lot of people will do like malt extract or like uh, yeast uh, um, extract, different blends and stuff like that. This works for me. Um, in your laboratory though, you're going to want to change the media that your uh, mushrooms are growing on every now and then so they don't get so um, lazy. They'll stop using all of their, in nature they have so many different things going on. They're like fighting off things. They're producing all these different enzymes and acids. If you just feed them the same thing over and over again, they'll just get tired and lazy and uh, not produce as much exotic things that you want. Um, so we get our dishes online, you can grab them on eBay, you can also use these jars as dishes which is very beneficial because you can just pour the uh, agar into these jars, close the jar up and pressure cook the whole thing, whereas when you use these dishes you have to uh, sterilize your agar in a different uh, uh, vessel and then pour it in where you're opening it up to the environment and there's potential that something can get in there. Question. Yes. There's pressure cooking and there's pressure canning. Mm -hmm. and I believe that they're different, so you keep saying pressure cooking is, um, and how long, and... Uh, there's a lot of different um, um, recipes, so to speak. Um, whenever I'm working with grains, I'll put that in the pressure cooker, and I'll run that for about an hour, 15 minutes at 15 PSI. And um, when I'm working with liquids, I'll do that at 10 PSI for about 30 minutes so I don't caramelize the material. Um, and then the rare occasions that I do sawdust, I'll go like an hour and 30 minutes at 15 PSI. Um, you can use pressure canners, um, like the Presto ones, they work really good. Most people use the All-American uh, pressure sterilizers, but um, any like for the most part, most pressure cookers will work as long as you can fit your jars in there. Uh, this is one from Afghanistan. They use a lot of pressure cookers for cooking their food there. Um, and uh, my dad brought that one back and it works fine for sterilizing just as any other wooden one. Um, so yeah, pouring agar. Uh, once you have your agar in your vessel, you pour it inside your clean uh, space or in front of your uh, flow hood into the dishes or you could just have it prepared in the jars already. Um, and then keeping your tools sterile. So when working with petri dishes, you're going to have to cut little sections out of it with a blade. Um, so you're going to either have to keep it a uh, flame. Um, a lot of people have butane torches in their house nowadays, so you could just use one of those. Uh, we have a back incinerator in the lab. You just stick the tool in there and it's super hot. It kills everything on the outside of it. So yeah, making the cut. Um, whenever you're cloning uh, onto agar, uh, you're going to split open your mushroom. The inside of that mushroom has never been exposed to the world before. It's nice and clean. Uh, you're going to take a little piece of that tissue out and stick it on the agar. Uh, when cloning onto cardboard in a less sterile environment, uh, you're going to want to go for the, uh, with the same ideals, break open the mushroom and use some of the inner tissue. Um, and then you're just going to roll that up in some cardboard that you have uh, maybe poured hot water on um, to give it a little uh, pasteurization. Um, whenever we do that, we just stuff the little cardboard rolled up with some mycelium in it in a little sandwich baggie and within a week or two, you'll start to see mycelium growing on it. 
the jump. This is what it looks like under a microscope uh, whenever we start to see fungi, uh, fungal uh, hyphae start to jump off of the tissue uh, that we put on there. Then it'll start to grow out all radially and beautifully and uh, you got yourself a nice mushroom culture. Um, so yeah, step two, propagate and myceliate. A lot of people uh, utilize the word colonize for the phase where the mushroom grows through the substrate. I think that term has some negative connotations with it. Uh, so once you have the culture, the next thing uh, you would do is propagate it to myceliate a new substrate. So you would expand it, take a piece off of it, put it into some new food, uh, and then watch it grow. Um, propagate means to start from the parent culture, and the propagation phase can take on so many different faces because you can propagate the material, uh, you can propagate your fungus onto whatever material it eats. Different fungi like different material. For the most part, oysters will grow on such a diverse uh, range of things. They have evolved to grow on uh, in every in, uh, environment that's non freezing. They have a, a crazy large tool belt. Um, sterilization and pa or pasteurization. We do a lot of pasteurization in big barrels. Uh, we uh, pasteurize 18 bags of sawdust at a time uh, in barrels that are kind of like a steamer. We have uh, cinder blocks at the bottom. We put water in there. Uh, we have a bunch of grill grates that we set our bags on. Uh, and then we have a turkey fryer at the bottom. So it just creates a steam. Then we have cinder blocks on the top to create a little bit of pressure. Um, I think I have a picture. Yeah, right here. Uh, and then we put a towel. Uh, in between the lid and the uh, uh, barrel. This creates a wet seal. So as it's creating steam, the towel gets wet. And we'll put way more, we put like four bricks on the top to help with the pressure. Um, but if, if the pressure gets too high, then steam will shoot out of the sides. Uh, if you clamp it, and some people will clamp it and try and turn their barrels into like a pressure cooker. It's a terrible idea. If the pressure gets too high, that barrel was not meant to hold pressure, the top will shoot off. And we've heard that happen with a couple of mushroom farms. Um, so yeah, sterilization, pasteurization is a big, plays a big role in your mushroom farming. Um, there's low-tech ways to do this. You can use hydrated lime if you're going to be working with straw. So you can fill your barrel with a bunch of water, stick your straw in there, put hydrated lime until the pH goes up above 11, let that sit overnight. Um, and then the, the next day as the uh, pH goes back down to 7, um, the material is a little bit uh, uh, pasteurized. It's killed off some of uh, the organisms and you can introduce oyster mushrooms to it at that point. Um, you can also do fermentation of straw. Uh, you can take your barrel or big container, stuff it filled with straw, shredded straw. Uh, works a little bit better. The smaller particle size is better for the mushrooms to grow on. Um, and just soak it in water for a week. Uh, that creates an anaerobic environment and whenever you pull the straw out of the water, uh, it's aerobic uh, and kills off an all the anaerobic bacteria of a small window uh, where there's not much living on that straw that you can introduce your oyster mushrooms. You can also boil your straw uh, for an hour. If you keep it above 160 degrees for an hour, uh, it's pasteurized enough to introduce oyster mushrooms to it. So a lot of people do straw cultivation whenever they're working with low-tech uh, mushrooms because you could just do that outside outside your barn. Uh, whenever I first started growing mushrooms, we did straw cultivation in a barn um, and it worked great. Um, so yeah, the super pasteurization that I do, uh, that's the term that we use for the barrel uh, pasteurization. Uh, you want a non-galvanized food grade steel drum. Uh, you're gonna wanna make sure you wet seal it with a towel. You're gonna need propane burners and cinder blocks. <coughs> Is that what you do for your um, sawdust and coffee? Yep, and yeah, that's how we sterilize it, or pasteurize everything, yeah. so. Um, I originally got a burner on Craigslist. It was so cool. It had three burners on it, so I could set two of my barrels right next to each other. But it was super old and rusty, as you could see. Uh, and eventually, the pipes caught on fire. Um, so I got two new ones. Um, they're Bayou Classic. I like. I really like that brand. Uh, they're they're wind resistant. Uh, they kill it. Um, and it typically takes one barrel of propane. We run the whole barrel, uh, or one one tank of propane. Uh, we'll run the whole tank. It's like the 20 pound tanks, I believe. Uh, we get that for $9. Uh, so it costs us $9 to run our, our tanks each time. But each of those bags has a base value of $20, if nothing. Uh, if we're just selling it just as the bag, we get $20 for it. But we always make more money off of it. So it's always like worth it to run uh, the material. Um, so expansion. Uh, once you once you have your sterile material, once you put your new uh, your your uh, material your fungal culture in there, you're just going to watch it uh, reconnect with itself. I find there a lot of like um, uh, alchemy with the mushrooms. Uh, in alchemy, there's a lot of separation and recombination uh, with the mushrooms. You're just breaking them up all the time and recombining them with themselves. So uh, here we have some oyster mushrooms that are on popcorn. Um, Oh, 
almost there. This is way easier with a bike tire. You don't want your uh, you don't want your mushroom cultures to get to that point where they're super colonized like that. Um, but you can pass that around and you can see um, the popcorn kernels in there. Um, all, each individual cell of the uh, mushroom culture has, an, has all of the necessities of life. Uh, it can perform all of the life functions. Uh, so if we separate each individual one of those popping uh, corns, there's like a whole colony, a whole network of mycelium in there. You can just take one of those kernels and put it into a new sterile media and it'll grow out. In some low socioeconomic uh, uh, southern Asian countries, they'll actually only take a couple grains and put them into the new uh, material uh, just because it's what's most uh, affordable. Um, here in the States, we're very liberal uh, with, our, with our grains. <laughs> um, click, click, what's going on? Mm -mm -mm. Get myceliated. Um, so yeah, you want you want your material to uh, fully grow on it. To you know, and sometimes you almost can't even recognize what the material was. When I passed around that coffee, that bag of coffee, um, somebody asked if it was bread earlier. I had some other ones out there. You just really can't even almost tell what it is. It's just like a big fungal body. I think this thing died on me. Oh, there we go. I just turned it off on accident. Um, so yeah, fruiting. This is step three. This is the final stage. Um, you're gonna have you're gonna want to have a fruiting chamber, a fruiting room. Um, some people will fruit uh, small amounts of mushrooms, maybe two bags in a in a tote like this. Um, line the bottom with perlite, um, and then soak your perlite so that it's uh, um, evaporating off water. And then you will open it up and mist it every day. Uh, fan it a little bit so that the CO2 comes out of the bottom and you can fruit mushrooms in a container like this. Some, some people fruit mushrooms in a bucket. If they only have one bag of mushrooms, you can just do it in a bucket, just spraying it like that. Um, some people will fruit them in those uh, small plastic greenhouses that come with the shelf units already in them. Uh, the mushroom community called it, calls those Marthas because uh, Martha Stewart sells them. Um, and, or you can then eventually uh, step up into a controlled environment, maybe your uh, basement space or a garage or a greenhouse. Um, outside on the side of my house, we have a very passive mushroom grow going on. Uh, I have a um, Shelter Logic carport. Um, I think it's like 20 by 18. And um, it built, we built it really easy. It withstands wind very well. Um, and it's been raining a lot this spring, so we haven't even had to go in there and spray it. Uh, but we have shelves of oyster mushroom spawn. We have reishi out there, and they just grow. And we don't really have to do anything. We don't ha I don't have humidity in there. I don't have lights in there. I just go in there with a spray bottle sometimes. We have a pump sprayer that just broke, so I've just been using a spray bottle until we buy another one. But because of all the rain, I haven't even gone in there and sprayed, and we've harvested pounds of mushrooms out of it. Um, so it's really cool to be able to do that outdoor uh, grows as well. Um, so yeah, you just want to have a place to fruit it in. Uh, each mushroom has its own uh, unique environmental preferences to fruit. Um, reishi, oyster mushrooms, lion's mane, shiitake, uh, they'll pretty much all grow in the same environment. Um, those are like some of the main ones that people are even growing anyways. Um, yeah, just like I said, luckily some mushrooms enjoy similar fruiting environments. So using skills like permaculture and biomimicry, we can try to understand the natural environment of the mushroom and develop better fruiting conditions. Uh, in our outdoor environment, we're fruiting mushrooms that we cloned from the same town uh, in which they're growing. So they grow very well there. Um, and modular fruiting is ideal, starting small. Um, when I first started growing, I was using hydroponic grow tents like people use for like growing like cannabis and stuff like that. Um, you can buy them at any hydro store, um, and they're great. They're meant for controlling an environment inside of. Um, so yeah, greenhouses and closets, they're way easier to manage, start out small, and then um, wait. I, I often tell people that I teach to wait until your system is uh, able to fund itself before you take anything from it. Um, so make sure that the mushrooms that you're harvesting from it are making are paying the electricity that it's using to be run. It's paying for the water that you're using to humidify it. Um, it paid for the the racks that it's growing on. It paid for the bags that you're using. It paid for it, the spawn itself, and then start using the funds to expand to grow your grow bigger. That's the only way that you'll be able to do it uh, without putting a dent in your pocket. Um, so yeah, this that's pretty much the end of the cultivation overview. What am I looking like on time? Are you kidding me? Whoa. Can I ask a good question? Yeah. With regards to the um, liquid spawn, and, mm -hmm. um, I had bought, you know, plug spawn before, and then somebody explained to me that I let it go bad. 
Mm -hmm. Yes, they have different shelf lives. Um, all of them that I sell, except for the cordyceps, will last about a year. The cordyceps one only lasts about six months. Um, it, it just, uh, it, it senesces faster than most mushrooms. So that's the term that you would use whenever the mushroom gets to the point where it's starting to um, um, not grow as well. It's a senescence. Uh, you can think about it like a, a senile old person. Um, the, there's a senescent old fungi. Um, so yeah. Um, this, this part of the presentation goes a little bit into some of the stuff that I covered yesterday, so I'm going to skip through some things. You can look at some pretty pictures. Woo! Pretty pictures. Cool stuff. Ooh, these were not shown yesterday. I did show my, uh, um, the Piptopore spatulinus bir birch polypore, my Piptopore eyes. Uh, these are the super sexy Agaricus campestris, like the the pretty cousin of the button mushrooms that grows out wild um, all over Lancaster County. Like all on the same day, you just find huge fairy rings because uh, the European people brought them over with the cattle uh, and the cow poop. They pooped all over the fields and then we got all these beautiful European campestrous mushrooms. Uh, uh, no, it's, uh, it's, it's a wild button. Yeah, wild button, Agaricus, Agaricus campestris. Um, that's my beautiful boy uh, before we cut all his hair off. Um, He's down there playing with all the kids. Uh, he, that was his first maitake find. Uh, he's really good at pointing out trees when we're foraging maitake. I, I used to like, carry him on my back, and he'll be like, how about that tree, how about that tree? He'll just like, pick out all the dead oaks, and then we'll walk over there, and I'll be like, oh, we found one. So that was the first one that he found. Um, he's been foraging mushrooms. He's going on, he's gonna be three next month, so going on three years. Um, uh, this is a beautiful one that wouldn't really be cultivated. Um, uh, this is the Entoloma arbortivum. That one is a parasite on the honey mushroom, which is also a parasite on trees. So a parasitic parasite. Um, but yeah, it's uh, known as shrimp of the woods. It tastes pretty dang good. Um, so yeah, um, you can just nerd out a little bit on mushrooms since we have a little extra time before we do our little inoculation there. Um, all mushrooms are nutraceuticals. All mushrooms hold med uh, medicinal properties, even the ones that are toxic. Uh, some of my friends like to say all mushrooms are edible uh, once. Um, but toxic mushrooms also contain polysaccharides. So polysaccharides are like the main components that you're going to be wanting from the mushrooms uh, that are uh, seen on a broad scale. Um, so as you eat these mushrooms, they're also providing you with a lot of uh, nutrition, a lot of uh, medicinal compounds. Um, here's a list of some of the medicinally active compounds that you'll find uh, when you're working with uh, we, I ran out of my powders. If you check our website, mycoshop.net, we're selling cordyceps powder right now, but a lot of the mycelium powders that you're going to find in the store, almost all the capsules, mushroom capsules that you'll find in the store are mycelium powders. Uh, they'll contain more of the enzymes and metabolites because uh, that actually contains the fungal body. So any fungus, any edible fungus or medicinal fungus that's growing on an edible substrate can be cooked and eaten or eaten raw. So that's growing on that popping corn over there. You could eat the popping corn, you can cook it up, eat it. Uh, I like to grow it on black beans. I really like the flavor of shiitake mixed with black beans and if you grow them in the wide mouth jars you can like pop it out especially like these ones have like a little bit of a lip to them if you get the shorter ones the wide mouth ones you could pop them out um, and uh, cut them into little sliders they're already in the perfect cylinder this one caught me off guard I was like what, what? I brought this to nerd out and show everybody this is uh, a little bit of the future of mushroom farming I think that there could be whole farms that are based around uh, growing sclerotia. This is a medicinal sclerotia or a tuber. Uh, this typically would grow underground. You can look at the top there, there's these interesting nodules. Uh, this is the Pleurotus tuber regium. Uh, this is an African oyster mushroom. It grows a tuber underground like a truffle um, because sometimes it gets really, really dry in Africa. And then when it rains, uh, it activates, it wakes up, and it puts out this huge mushroom that's attached to the tuber. So that tuber is super medicinal. It's like loaded with like energy storage. It's like we're going to put all of our goodness into this thing while we wait until it's time for us to fruit. So it's loaded with the uh, beta-glucans uh, and polysaccharides. Uh, it has a very interesting taste, kind of acrid, um, I, but I think it could be uh, in, in introduced into a lot of different medicines, and there's a whole bunch of other uh, species that form sclerotia that we haven't been uh, studying as much. So I think we can uh, get into some sclerotia cultivation. It's really easy. Um, they just grow in containers on grains, um, and you never even have to open it until it's done. Um, nootropic mushrooms, so mushrooms that are used to enhance memory or other cognitive functions. Uh, mushrooms in the Herisium genus are uh, uh, containing unique molecular compounds. Are you, what's your name again? Adam. 
Adam, Adam mentioned this in his talk. Um, uh, they have uh, arenacine, serichinone, uh, compounds that are known to uh, uh, aid neurological health. Um, this mushroom here, uh, this is Talipocladium ophioglossoides. It used to be considered co uh, cordyceps ophioglossoides. This one is actually has uh, antifungal properties. There's some mushrooms that have antifungal properties. This one grows on false truffles. Uh, so you'll find them in pine areas on the Elaphomyces granulus, uh, little deer truffles uh, growing out of mossy areas. Um, this one is shown to be effective against prostate health, but also have uh, neurological enhancing uh, properties. Um, and as far as I know, I might be the first, pers the first human in history to cultivate fruit bodies of this in, uh, in um, controlled environments. I could find no literature on anybody cultivating these mushrooms at all in the world, uh, only people that have been studying the fungus. So uh, we've got this mushroom to grow like we've got the cordyceps to grow. I also sell cultures and I wrote about it in my book. Um, Medicinal mushrooms. We mostly grow reishi for our medicinals. We also grow lion's mane, but we mostly sell that as a gourmet. Um, medicinal mushrooms that are wild crafted or grown outside, they've been exposed to vitamin D. Uh, mushrooms have a steroid alcohol, like most organisms, uh, humans and animals, we have cholesterol. Mushrooms have ergosterol. Uh, whenever the ergosterol is uh, exposed to sunlight, it gets converted into vitamin D2, uh, making mushrooms the only produce source of vitamin D. Um, and mushrooms that are grown outside, they're adjusted to local microorganisms, they're adjusted to local pathogens, and a lot of times they've developed uh, compounds that protect them from those local pathogens. It can also help to protect you from them. Um, and then if they're growing on trees or on logs, they will also contain beneficial compounds from those trees and logs, as well as uh, mineral content that the tree had accumulated. Um, cultivated mushrooms are available all year, and then you have access to non-local mushrooms. So shiitake is native to Asia. It did not grow in the United States until the late 70s, early 80s, um, after people had cultivated in our environment long enough for it to become acclimated. Um, now we can find wild shiitake uh, all up and down the East Coast. A lot of wild shiitake outside Asheville, um, and I even got a sample of wild shiitake from Boston last year. Um, Medicinal products, so you can use the mycelium, uh, you can make extracts from your mushrooms. I ran out of extracts that I have, um, but you can use alcohol, you can use uh, hot water to extract uh, beautiful oils from the mushroom. Um, the cordyceps have loads of oil, lion's mane has loads of oil. When working with the dry product, you will see like a hash on your fingers, um, and it's very easy to extract. Um, reishi, so this is uh, one that we cultivate a lot. You can grow reishi on pure coffee grounds like we're gonna do today. Um, this is one of the most researched mushrooms on the planet. Unfortunately, most of the research refers to the mushroom as Ganoderma lucidum. Uh, Ganoderma lucidum is endemic to Europe. There is no Ganoderma lucidum that grows in North America. Um, a lot of times people are confusing our hemlock varnish reishi the uh, Ganoderma tsuge or the Ganoderma cutisii or Ganoderma aplanatum, artis conch, uh, with Ganoderma lucidum. Um, that kind of stinks because there's all sorts of mushrooms that have been classified as that and they have different levels of different compounds uh, which would be uh, more beneficial if we can know. Um, so that's where we're moving a little bit more with my lab. Uh, we're going to be getting um, liquid uh, uh, liquid and gas mass spectrometry equipment uh, so that we can analyze the compounds in our mushrooms and our, our uh, product that we're producing, uh, see what, the, what actually is in it, um, and we can put out our own research. Um, so these are some local reishi that you can find around Pennsylvania. Uh, again, at Ermatsuge, we're finding lots of these because of the woolly adelgid affecting the hemlock population. Uh, we also find the Ganoderma sessile uh, stemless reishi that will be growing on maple trees. Uh, the Ganoderma caticii, the yellow reishi, will also be growing on uh, maple trees. Um, so yeah, reishi has a huge history of medicinal use. Taoist sages over 200 centuries ago uh, used the power of observation to find out uh, things about this mushroom just by taking it into their body, seeing and being sensitive of their own body. Uh, they found out things that we're finding now with modern technology. Uh, the reishi antler. Uh, a lot of people accidentally grow reishi this way because they fill up grow rooms or little uh, tents with this. Um, mushrooms do not like CO2 and they produce a lot of CO2 as they burn through their material and as they grow. Um, so a lot of mushrooms, they just won't grow whenever there's high CO2. They still think they're underground. They still think they're inside of a log. Uh, so they just won't even produce mushrooms. But reishi, they'll just start producing these long antlers like, where's the oxygen? We got to find the oxygen. Um, so there's a broad market for these. You can sell them as medicinals. I've had people buy them as wands, uh, dowsing rods, um, art, all sorts of things. Um, really cool stuff. Um, and if you think about it, like um, you harvest your burdock root in the spring because that's where the energy is. Uh, if you're going to eat the stems, you're going to harvest them once they 
they shoot out. And then once it's flowering, you're really not going to want to eat any of the rest of it because it's going to be a little bit more bitter. Um, you're going to want to uh, get it where the energy is the most. So if you're if the mushroom hasn't gone into producing spores, whenever it's in this antler form, it doesn't produce any spores. So if it hasn't been putting its energy into spores, you would think uh, that it has a little bit more of that vitality inside of the mushroom. Um, Cordyceps, uh, we'll find some on insects, we'll find some on the false truffle, so that's one that's actually attached to the truffle there. We call this one the golden thread cordyceps because where it hasn't been exposed to oxygen, it'll be nice and gold. Whenever I grew them in cultivation, the whole thing stayed gold because it was growing inside of a jar. Uh, there's uh, estimated over 680 species of cordyceps, but there is also belief that every insect has a cordyceps species associated with it, so there might be lots of cordyceps. Um, I would love to go on and on about cordyceps forever. It's one of my favorite things. Um, I'm just gonna keep uh, nerding out with you guys a little bit longer and uh, before we get onto this hands-on thing. So if you're dealing with an oxygen-free environment with the pressure canning or pressure cooking and all, do you have to worry about uh, botulism at all? Botulism? Like, because botulism likes to grow in an oxygen-free environment. Mm, well, uh, all right, so there is oxygen inside of there. That's why we have the, the filter part on the top. Okay. Um, I've not heard of anybody having any problems with botulism. I thought only babies got that. Um, I haven't heard of it like as a, it's like an anaerobic bacteria or something. Yes. Yeah. Um, if there's oxygen, then it wouldn't be. Oxygen. Yeah, yeah. All of them have fil yeah. All of them have filters. Even the bags have filter patches. Um, uh, there's less oxygen in there than there is outside. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're, it's mostly CO2 that they're pushing out and then they have like a passive uh, intake of oxygen in there. Um, chaga really can't be cultivated, so there's not really a need for me to be uh, talking about that one as much. Um, oyster mushrooms, they're great. They grow on all sorts of different substrates. Um, we're gonna be playing with some oyster mushroom today, probably the popcorn one. Um, Agaricus genus, these get looked over for their medicinal properties often, um, but they're very medicinal. They are actually the highest protein mushroom that I know of, uh, coming in at 30% protein dry weight. Um, but yeah, they can help in preventing debility. They're very nutritious. They're good for uh, indigestion, insuffic uh, insufficient breast milk production, uh, and have lots of vitamins. Um, so lichens are cool. I talk about those sometimes, but I don't know anybody cultivating lichens just yet. Um, here's some other mushrooms that we grow. Uh, the pink and golds, this is what the pinks look like. Um, the Horatiums, lion's mane, they're super beautiful. Uh, we get the highest market value on our lion's mane. Uh, we sell those at $10 a pound wholesale, and we do $10 for a quart, uh, or we'll just sell them $5 for like an individual at, at market stands. Um, shiitake, they have a long vegetation phase. Uh, they're delicious, meaty texture, super rewarding to grow. Um, I don't like to grow shiitake from start as much because they have to go through this browning phase. Uh, it takes a long time and you have to develop techniques for it. It doesn't really work in my system, so sometimes we'll buy shiitake blocks. Uh, we're very close to Kennet Square um, where they produce incredible amounts of, of mushroom spawn in mushrooms. So uh, a lot of mushroom farmers that I know will actually buy their mushroom spawn. Uh, we're also working with some uh, collectives of uh, different mushroom farmers around the East Coast, uh, New Jersey area, uh, that are working together to provide spawn to each other. Um, wine caps, they're quickly becoming one of the most culti commonly cultivated mushrooms in the scene, especially the permaculture scene, uh, because permaculture nerds love wood chips, wine caps love wood chips, mm -hmm. Wine caps turn wood chips into soil faster than wood chips turn into soil laying by themselves. So uh, they're super delicious. Um, and if you water your wine cap patches, you can get them to fruit consistently. Uh, we've had one been fruiting consistently since uh, late April. Um, and we have a bunch of patches in different, in different areas because we're working on developing gardens. So we need to develop soil in, the, in those areas. It's a great way to start. Um, they're very rustic looking, delicious. Tastes like a mix of like potatoes and asparagus with wine. Especially when when you open the when the caps open and the spores like come out, you get this like um, uh, black like juice when they're cooking down, um, and then they reabsorb it, and it's amazing. Um, Namico mushrooms they'll also grow in wood chips. They grow in colder temperatures. Uh, they're kind of slimy on the top. Um, the, you can use that slime for thickening uh, soups, uh, and they're actually a very crunchy mushroom. And if you don't like the slime, you can just cook it away. Um, so yeah, our mushroom festival's coming up. Uh, first weekend of August, 4th through the 6th, outside Harrisburg, Camp Riley. Um, come out, nerd out with us. There's gonna be all the experts from Northeast and Mid-Atlantic. Uh, 
just teaching about stuff, guiding walks, cooking up mushrooms over the fire. Um, this is Tyler from uh, uh, Micropolitan over in Philadelphia. He came through with all the chanterelles and we just cooked them up over the flames. We had all sorts of great things. There was like chanterelle milkshakes there. Um, we ate like dead man's fingers, all sorts of weird things. Um, and found more cordyceps. Uh, we're also doing a cordyceps expedition the last weekend of uh, July. Um, so that's gonna be the first one that we've done. Uh, I don't know too many other people doing cordyceps expeditions in North America, but we know where to find lots of them and there's a necessity to get more genetics into the uh, cultivation community. Um, so yeah. Uh, that's what I've got for you guys, and we'll uh, expand some more coffee grounds for anybody that didn't get the opportunity to do that yesterday. And then if you did do it yesterday, you can totally do it again. I won't, I won't say nothing. Um, so whenever I'm doing these expansions, I really like to use these uh, trash bags. You can just buy large rolls of these. I go to the restaurant store and just get a box of them. Um, this technique that we're about to uh, do also works very well with uh, yesterday's news. Um, it's like, it's a brand of cat litter, but uh, it works the same with all paper. Um, the yesterday's news, like cat litter is like 99.9% .9 recycled paper. Um, so, and it comes in these little pellets. I really like it. Like I would pelletize a lot of stuff if I had a machine to pelletize it. I think the heat actually helps with some of the pasteurization. Uh, but you'll just add water to some to paper. Um, some people will add hot water for extra sterility, but I've been in like all sorts of permaculture situations, all sorts of farms where I just, had a spigot on the outside of a barn and some paper that we pulled out of a trash can and did it like that and people took it home and had success with, with the mushrooms growing onto the material. Um, so unfortunately I dumped a lot of spawn on top of this, um, but we'll get down into the coffee. Oh, if anybody didn't get a chance to yesterday, I recommend you um, smell this oyster mushroom spawn. Um, it will smell like the mushrooms, and if it doesn't smell like the mushrooms, then there might be something a little bit wrong. Right now, it smells a little bit like coffee because it's been sitting on coffee all night. But if you want to be adventurous and smell the uh, oyster mushrooms, you're more than welcome to. I'm going to set it on this chair here, and I'll get into this coffee ground. So these coffee grounds are courtesy of Brew Cumberland's Best in New Cumberland, Pennsylvania. Uh, they are good friends of mine. Uh, they're expanding out, and they produce lots of coffee that we use for our gardens and all of our mushroom cultivation. Uh, maybe I should pull this table over. Mm -mm -mm. Does anybody have any questions? Just, um, you're, you're gonna wanna use more fresh wood chips or wood chips that have been sitting out in the sun because if you have a big pile of wood chips that's been sitting in the shade, uh, if you dig into it, you'll probably see like a big cloud of like mold spores come out of it. Uh, that's, you don't want that. That's, that's a no-no. What happens if you have a sterilization issue? With this, like with. Um, well, outdoors is not as big of a deal. Like a lot of times you will get some other things that will grow in your little outdoor or grow. Um, but if, if I had a bag of, if, if I had this bag um, and there was like a bunch of like green mold growing all in it, um, the mushrooms would not grow as well. Um, and then there's the, then uh, you can risk when harvesting it, having uh, the mold on it that could possibly get somebody sick. But that's the biggest issue. I mean like all the mushrooms outside are growing in conjunction with all sorts of mold and bacteria and it's not really a big deal. And they'll still grow. Um, it's just a little bit detrimental, and sometimes the mold or bacteria will overtake uh, uh, the mushroom and, and grow faster than it, not allowing it to grow fully on the material. So um, I use a lot of rubbing alcohol. I like to use 71%. This is actually 91. It's just all that I had whenever I went to store that time. Um, but the 71% evaporates a little bit slower, so it gives you more time to work uh, before it's all gone. And alcohol actually sterilizes on evaporation. So once it's evaporated is when it kills, it breaks open the cells of the, of the uh, bacteria and things. Um, so if everybody comes up, they'll spray their hand uh, with the alcohol, take a little um, bag to put their spawn in. They can grab, uh, scoop up some of the spawn how, in whatever fashion they like. Um, I recommend a scoop like this and then turning your bag inside out. Um, and then we'll sprinkle, where's that? Can I get that popcorn one? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so we'll take this little popcorn thing and uh, sprinkle some spawn in there. Is there a different type of mushroom than yesterday? 
Um, uh, this is a phoenix oyster mushroom. So this one will grow on coniferous trees. It will grow on hardwoods as well. <coughs> so if you want to expand it, you can. Um, that's just pure, pure uh, coffee grounds? Yeah, this is just pure espresso, yeah. I like the espresso um, the best. Um, it, yeah, it's, fi it's finer, um, and, it, and they don't have the filters in it. Um, so it's like whenever I'm putting it into my, mixing it with my sawdust, I don't want a bunch of filters in there. It just makes it harder to mix it all up. Um, so typically, if we get any coffee with filters, we just put it into our big um, hot compost um, and use it for the garden stuff. Um, yeah, so just get those in there. They're a little sticky. Um, it's it's going to be a little bit more interesting uh, for if anybody did if anybody did one yesterday and does one with the corn or today, um, you'll see like the inoculation points further away. Uh, whenever you introduce the sawdust, there's just so many little particles of sawdust, so it kind of just like closes in on itself really fast. Uh, when you put in the little uh, pieces of corn, you see like one for over here, one over here, one over here. Um, so yeah, once you have your material in there, uh, just tie it off, um, and there'll be enough oxygen in there, and enough oxygen that can be able to go through your little knot um, while it grows. Set this in a cool, dark area. If you set it in direct sunlight, it'll, it'll dry it out. Um, you'll see it turn completely white like this. Um, and then once it gets to this point, um, you can, you'll probably be able to fruit like one cluster of oyster mushrooms off of this amount of material, but I would recommend expanding it out. Um, what you could do is uh, keep a jar, maybe a quart jar, a half gallon jar next to your coffee machine or wherever you make tea. Um, and once this is fully grown, just sprinkle a little bit in the bottom. Uh, once your tea or your coffee has cooled down after you've brewed it, it's like a pasteurization. You drop that in there, wait till it grows fully on there, then sprinkle a little bit more, sprinkle a little bit more coffee. Uh, wait till it grows up to the top, and then just simply unscrew your lid, and whenever the mushrooms are ready to grow, they'll just pop the top off and start growing out. Then you just have to mist it. Cool. All right, guys, do your thing. I'm here. I can answer questions. Um, this is the last thing that I'm, I'll be doing. I, I highly recommend checking out the YouTube channel. Um, we're going to be working on a lot of uh, algae. Yeah, I have, have multiple cards here. We have stuff with our events, our markets, phone number. Um, I'm going to be working on a lot more algae stuff moving forward. We're going to be playing around with some more biodiesel and uh, sustainable energy production uh, throughout the year. Um, possibly starting up an insect farm uh, in late winter. Um, and. Uh, doing some more urban mushroom farmer trainings. We have an urban mushroom farmer training coming up this month. I think it starts on the 23rd. Um, is it on here? Yeah, June 23rd, 25th is the next urban mushroom farmer training. That's a four-day training, uh, $350, $250 if you're a student of any sort. Um, and then we'll have another one of those in September. Um, those are really great. Uh, we go through the whole process. I take you to all of our facilities. You get hands-on and you leave with a bunch of cultures. Um, we have a culture library of over 50 species of mushroom, mostly local native species. Um, yeah, I'm just going to continue to implement my permaculture on, to, on social levels, um, helping to alleviate economic stress in the areas in which I reside. Um, Pennsylvania is a beautiful home right now, uh, but I see myself moving through the network a lot. Um, there is a large international uh, viewing on the work that I've been doing. Um, so I think I'm going to try and uh, jump around a little bit, um, spread the word a little bit more. So I really appreciate everybody that's participated in any of my workshops this weekend. Uh, I hope to see you in the future. <laughs>